Good morning. Before we dive into our lesson today, I'd like to make a couple brief announcements that I think are exciting and important. The first is, is that on October the 2nd, that's two Sundays from today, Lenore and I would like to extend an invitation to all of our, how do we phrase this, all of our senior saints. You know if you fall into that category. If you have doubt about it, you probably do. But we would like to invite all of our senior saints to our home on Sunday afternoon from 2 to 4 for just a little open house. Um, if you've never been to the preacher's house before, this is your opportunity. We'd love to have you come. We'll have a few little finger food, snack foods, and just a time to visit and to share and to get to know each other better. So if you're one of our senior saints, and or you're married to one of our senior saints and you want to come along, I mean, we're not putting an age on this. So uh, just, just if we'd like to invite you to come and to share a little time with us at an open house at our home. And the bu- our address will be in the bulletin in the next couple of weeks. So keep that in mind. Now the second thing that we'd like to announce is I am so thrilled and excited about this and I hope you will be too. For the first time in many years, the Waterford Church of Christ on November the 13th, that's in a couple months from now, is going to have a Friends and Family Day. I don't know if you've ever been involved in anything like that, but it's an opportunity for you to invite your friends and family to know what it's like to be involved with and to share in your church family here at the Waterford Church of Christ. And for that day, we don't know what our attendance will be, but we expect that it will be an exciting turnout. So what I'd like to request of all of you is start right now, today, I mean not right now, after the sermon would be better, (laughs) but start today and make a list. Think about your neighbors, I've already got a few in in our mind, our next door neighbors and then some folks that Lenora works with. Make a list of different folks that you can invite. We're going to have invitations made up for you that will have a little map and address and kind of the events of the day. And think about, you need to think about this too, what will be the most convenient time for your visitors to come? Because that day, we will have three morning worship services. Three. We've talked about this for some time because I don't know if you realize this, but many Sundays we're almost at capacity in both services. So on that day, we'll have three different, so during the Bible class hour, there'll be another worship, and we'll have Bible classes during the second two worships at the same time. So it's going to be a little bit of a logistical challenge, but we're very, very excited to look forward to the future and to see what we can do to introduce this. Uh, Do you believe this is a great family? Are you proud to be a part of this church? Don't you want to introduce it to as many of your friends and family as you can? So be making a list today. Thinking about people you can invite. And the great thing about a friends and family day, you can get people to come who wouldn't normally come. You know how you do it? You hand them an invitation and say, you know, we're having a friends and family day. Everybody's inviting people. And if you don't come, I'm going to look bad. I need somebody to come with me. You know, I'm being funny. But you can, you can kind of use it as a springboard to get folks to come who wouldn't normally come and get to know our family here at the Waterford Church of Christ. Isn't that exciting? I hope you're as excited as I am. This morning we're going to talk about an issue of distinction. An issue of distinction. When you look at this church family and who we are, we're one of many, many, many groups here in this immediate area. If you look in the Detroit metro area, you'd be talking about hundreds if not thousands of religious groups that claim some affiliation with Christianity. But when you look even in the Waterford community, there's going to be dozens and dozens of groups of all shapes and sizes. Some meet in in elaborate church buildings on main roads. Others meet in little storefronts and others even meet in homes. They claim some affiliation and desire to worship God through Jesus Christ and be Christian. And there's so much division and, and really dissent, if you will, in the religious world. It's discouraging. Are you ever discouraged by that? In fact, Mead's Handbook of Religion 
some 20 years ago when I was first looking into this in school, at that time had 326 distinct denominations of Christianity operating within the United States. 326 distinct de de denominations, divisions. Now, that doesn't mean subdivisions or subcategories. For instance, in the Churches of Christ, we have what we would call the mainline group, and then we have a non-institutional group, and then we have a one-cup only group. If you don't know what any of that is, be grateful, okay? But we have a few little distinctions even amongst ourselves, but we're counted in Mead's Handbook of Religion as one. If you look at other religious groups, they have many, many more subdivisions of themselves. If you were to look, it's beyond 326. It numbers in the thousands. And the problem is, is that in Scripture, one of the most heartfelt concerns that our Lord had was on unity. Have you ever noticed that when you read through the Scriptures? The entire chapter of Ephesians chapter 4 concerns itself with unity. Unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And he talks about the different attitudes that we have to have for unity. Long-suffering for one another. And then he goes through and he talks about the different, the different absolutes of unity. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all. And then he talks about the agents of unity. He says he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastoring teachers for the edifying of the body, for the unity of the saints. But the most telling verse to me about the importance of God's people being one would be in Jesus' prayer in Matthew when he's talking, excuse me, John chapter 17, when Jesus is praying there in the garden. And he says in verse 20, My prayer is not for these alone, talking about the disciples, his apostles, but for also for those who would believe on me through their word. That's you. Amen. That's me. We have all found faith because we believed in the inspired words of the apostles that were shared with us through the scriptures. So he says, for those who believe on me through word, that they, now he could ask for anything. He could have said that they might be devoted. He could have said that they might be strong in the faith. He could have said that they might be wise in the things that they do. He could have said that they might be doctrinally sound. That's important. All of the above are important. All of the above are desirous of our Lord for His people. But none of those are what He prayed for when He asked for one thing on the eve of His death. That they may be one. Even as Thou, Father, art in me and I in Thee, that they may be in us, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent me. The thing Jesus wanted... That they may be 326 different major divisions and hundreds of others underneath those categories. That's not what he prayed. Now here's the problem. Knowing that and fixing that are two very different things. In fact, I don't know how to fix that. I don't know how to fix that there's 300 plus different types of folks who worship God in the name of Christ. I think part of the reason that we exist as the churches of Christ, as the restoration movement, is because we recognize that that is displeasing to what the Lord wanted. In fact, the restoration movement was a movement of unity, not division. It was born out of an idea that all of these different groups, that's not what the Lord wanted. What He wanted was unity for us to be one. And so how could that be achieved? Because here's the problem. Baxter, he's wiser than I am. You are. Look at that gray hair. You're wiser than I am. <laughs> but he's got, I mean, he's got his opinions and I've got my opinions. Brother Ali 
He's got his opinions, and you've got your opinions, and I've got mine. And Brother Don, he's got his opinions. You see, we all got our own different ideas. And we look at one scripture, and I, this has happened with brethren. It will happen again. It's happened right here. We sit down with the scriptures, and we look, and we say, well, I think it means that. No, I think it means this. So who's right? Who's right, Brother Ali? That's the thing. Is it nice that I have my opinion, and Brother Ali has his opinion, Brother Baxter has his opinion, Brother Don has his opinion? But when it comes to the question of what we practice, whose opinion we follow, mine is, even though he's wiser than I am, mine is as good as Baxter's. And his is as good as Don's, and Don's is as good as Allie's. Right? So what's the only way to know? To go past any of our opinions and look to a standard. And the plea of the restoration movement, and it's been forgotten. I'm telling you, it's been forgotten. I preached in the buckle of the Bible Belt years and years and years. And I can tell you, I can count on one hand the lessons on restoration that I've heard. Because we talk about being the church of Christ, the church of Christ, the church of Christ. What does that even mean? The church of Christ doing things His way according to His will, not our own. And so this idea of being a restoration church which is what we're trying to be right here, is to be a congregation that submits in all things for the purpose and with the aim and the goal and the hope of unity to be able to say to all of our religious friends and neighbors, you know, that is a good opinion and here's my opinion, but you know what? We're willing to give up our opinion. Are you? We just want to submit to His will not to our own. That's the restoration plea. And it's for the purpose of achieving unity the only way that unity could ever be possible. Now, with that in mind, because of that, because of this desire to submit to the Scriptures, there have been some things that would be, I guess, identifying markers of the Waterford Church of Christ and other congregations like ours that would cause us to be distinct or look different, perhaps, than some of our well-intending, sincere, religious friends and neighbors. Some of those things might be the fact that this morning uh, we sang and we didn't have any sort of accompaniment other than our voices. And we, we've chosen to do that because we see in Scripture that that seems to be how it is that the first century church worshipped. And for 400 years after that point, that's how God's people chose to worship. So we want to be as true to those Scriptures as we can be. Amen? And then we look and we, we've taken the Lord's Supper this Sunday and we took the Lord's Supper last Sunday and we took the Lord's Supper the Sunday before that and we'll take it again next Sunday. And we've chosen to do that because when we look in the Scriptures... We see that there's a pattern that the first century church, that the Lord's Supper was as off they came together every first day of the week. They partook of the Lord's Supper. And then as we examine, and there's so many other things. For instance, in this congregation, we have evangelists like myself. We have shepherds, elders. We have deacons. Because that's how we see that the New Testament church was organized. But none of those are perhaps the most distinctive identifying feature of who we are in this congregation and others like us in regard to differences from the religious world around us. I, I suppose the most distinctive feature of the restoration movement has to do with baptism. Wouldn't you agree? You see, the predominant view in the religious world in the United States is that baptism is its kind of like a demonstration. It's something that you do religiously, but it doesn't really have anything to do with 
who you are or whether you have relationship with God. It's just kind of a demonstration of the faith that you already have. That's probably a pretty good way to describe how many would see it. So many sincere religious people would believe that a person is saved and comes in contact, has their sins cleansed away when they believe in Christ Jesus or perhaps when they speak the words of a sinner's prayer or perhaps when they take Jesus into their heart as their personal Savior. There's a whole lot of language that's connected to this and different folks would express it in different ways, but it all boils down to the fact that there's no activity involved in it. It's simply a mental assent, a mental belief that brings about instantaneous salvation in the mind of God and that any external baptism is simply a demonstration for the benefit of others of what has already happened. That's a fair assessment of the predominant view in the religious world. As you know, here at the Waterford Church of Christ, we teach something very different from that. Here's the reason why. The scriptures teach something very different from that. In fact, were we to walk through the New Testament, I believe with all of my heart, after the countless years and hours of study, as I've looked at this subject again and again and again and tried to be open-minded with a sincere heart, is this idea of being saved apart from any type of water baptism. Is there any credibility to that? I've asked that question sincerely, honestly. And here are the things that I found. Matthew. In the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said this. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel unto all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But he said it even more directly in the account of the Great Commission in the book of Mark. Because in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, Jesus said this, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who believeth not will be condemned. Jesus said it in a little different way in the book of John. In John chapter 3, verses 3 and then in verse 5, Jesus said, lest a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus asked him, he said, well, what do you mean? Am I to enter again into my mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, no, lest a man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then you turn over to the book of Acts, the history of the Lord's church. And in the book of Acts, you have a number of passages that speak to this. In fact, one was read to us this morning. Mark did a good job with that. As he started in in verse 36 of Acts chapter 2. Thereafter that, as Peter concludes that first gospel sermon, on the very first day of the Lord's church, he concludes and says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Amen. And they were pierced to the heart. And it said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what can we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, as many as the Lord your God will call. You look over in Acts chapter 8, and you have Philip who is whisked away from his work in Samaria to meet with an Ethiopian eunuch as he travels back from Jerusalem, and he's reading the scriptures. He doesn't understand parts of them. The scriptures say that Philip taught him Jesus, and the result of teaching him Jesus is the eunuch asked this question. Well, here is water. What hindereth me 
from being baptized. And the text says that they went down into the water and he was baptized, buried in that watery grave. And then the Spirit whisked Philip away to continue his mission elsewhere. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, you've had Ananias who speaks to Saul of Tarsus as he's about to become the great apostle Paul. And he says, and now do you, why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We look in places like Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27, where he tells us, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We continue on and we look in places like 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 21, where it says, This baptism doth now save you also, not the removal of filth from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. We could go on. There can be no doubt that the scriptures are clear in their connection with water baptism and saving faith as to the moment that God cleanses man of his sin and makes him one of his own. There can be no doubt. So why is it that there's been so much question, so much confusion? Well, I think part of it is that the scriptures, although they're plain in their importance of this, I think the problem is sometimes not baptism itself, but the implications of the truth. You see, sometimes truth is difficult. It's difficult. If I were to come to you and talk about the person in your life who just absolutely meant the most to you, the most to you, who would that be for some? I mean, maybe it's your grandfather or your grandmother. Somebody who just, you look to almost with sainthood. You understand what I mean? And I were to say to you, teach you something that was exactly contradictory to something that this wonderful person in your life had taught you and believed with all of his or her heart. Regardless of what evidence I gave you, Regardless of what proof I showed you, it would be very, very difficult, difficult for you to change. Can we all understand that? I know, I come from farming country down in Arkansas. I know folks who drive a certain color tractor, even though it's not the best tractor they could buy and they're fixing it all the time because their granddad swore by that kind of tractor. And if you ask him, you say, well, don't you know this other one's better? Well, I don't know. My granddad always thought this was the best one, and I, this is what we've always drove. You know, understand? Some of you drive a certain kind of pickup because of that, you know? And those are just simple examples, and they don't have life-changing or soul implying consequences, but the reality is it's the same exact problem. When it comes to this idea, the fact that the religious world has so bought into the idea that baptism has nothing to do with salvation means that there have been generation after generation of good-hearted, sincere, kind, loving, fine people wonderful people who did not know the truth revealed in Scripture on this subject. You understand? So when we approach people, I think that must be kept in mind. And I want to be honest, I think we failed as we've approached those people at times. Because we failed in that we've been uncompassionate to that difficulty. We've been overly aggressive and abrasive in our approach. 
and not sensitive and honoring of the fine, good-hearted, loving, kind people that have given our friends and neighbors so much. Now that doesn't mean that we would in any way compromise what the scriptures say. But it does mean that we follow another commandment which is to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Gentle with all men as we approach the truth in the right kind of spirit. Then we have our own confusion. Although we understand the essentiality of baptism, I wonder sometimes if we understand the function of it. That what it actually is. I've known, I've been in the Lord's church all of my life since the first Sunday after I was born. And I have heard lesson after lesson after lesson in Bible class after Bible class concerning the essentiality and the importance of baptism. And that's good. We've done that this morning. We need that periodically to remember. It is a foundational truth and it is a distinctive marker of who we are. But if something's a, a distinctive marker of who you are, don't you think you should understand it? Amen. But yet we've had members of the church who present the the beautiful truth of new birth that takes place in the waters of baptism in a way that is absolutely, well, it's just, it's atrocious. Because it makes some of the accusations by our religious friends and neighbors who don't understand at all because they've never been taught, it makes some of their misunderstandings and accusations actually true. Like for instance, well, those Church of Christ people, they believe in what, baptismal regeneration, water regeneration. And what that's basically saying is, well, Church of Christ folks, they believe that the water saves people. Let me make very clear. There is nothing magical about that water. It could be Flint water. <laughs> that wasn't very nice. I'm sorry. It could be it could be third world country water. How's that better? And it would still have the same. It could be, you know, Dasani. You could fill that thing full of Dasani water bottles. The water doesn't matter. Amen. It's just water. It can be a baptistry. It can be a bathtub. It can be a swimming pool. And it can be a creek. Cold creeks are the best. Because you remember it forever. <laughs> it could be any of those... Because it's not about the water. Do you understand? We do not believe in the Lord's church because we try to believe the truth. We don't believe that there's anything magical. The other thing that's often accused is, well, you believe you're saved by works. That if you go through this and do this work, then you're saved. For we are saved by grace. This is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Through faith. Not of works. Lest anyone should boast. You cannot be saved by anything you do. Is that clear? Oh, I know we've misunderstood before. And I've heard my brethren turn over to James chapter 2. And try to argue from that and say, yes, we're saved by faith and works. That is not what James is saying. He's saying there's a certain kind of faith that does work. And that's the faith that saves. But it's not a coupling of two things. We're not saved by two things, faith and works. We're saved by one thing, a working faith. You see, those are different. Because to say I'm saved by faith, that means God does, you know, I do that part, but then works, then I do my part, and you put the two together and we're... No, you know how much of your part will get you to heaven? None. You can't do enough. Right? You see, what's interesting about that is that Baptism doesn't really fit the idea of a work anyway because I don't know anyone who's ever baptized themselves. <laughs> baptism is not something you do. It's something that is done to you. Amen. It is not a work. It is a submission. In fact, you stand there and you just die to yourself. Right? You don't do anything. 
you submit. Now, we kind of understand its purpose when we look over in Colossians. Go over there real quickly. Colossians chapter 2, 11 through 12 is an intriguing text. Because it says, In him you also were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of sin of the flesh and the circumcision of Christ. Verse 12. Buried with him in baptism in which you also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. You see, when a little baby was circumcised under the Old Testament law, was, would anyone say, well, that baby, he was working his way to relationship with God? No. That little baby, all he did was lay there. And it was something that was done to him. It was the cutting away. And it tells us that spiritually, when we're baptized, it just like that infant, because we are born again as an infant in Christ, it is a cutting away of sin. The only thing we do is submit. That's all we do. And so it's important, and we'll always have those, those arguments that come at us that we have to answer, but it's important that we know ourselves what it is that we do when we're baptized into Christ. It is not a checklist. It is not a work. And, and we've expressed this sometimes. I've seen folks who just, they'll almost do anything to convince someone to be baptized. To trick them, or to push them, or to guilt them, or to try to, you know, put the pressure on. Folks, don't do that, because even if they're baptized, it won't take It has to be a faith. Now I know, we, we have good intentions, but there's nothing magical in the act. It's the submission of faith. So if you're concerned about somebody, build faith in them. Now you have to talk about baptism and that. That's what Philip did with the Ethiopian eunuch. That's why he asked when he preached him, Jesus, here's water, what keeps me from being baptized? So you mention it, you talk about you make clear that that's the culmination of faith, the moment that faith becomes a reality. And they are united with Christ and saved from their sins. But don't just push water, 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 water. Push love the Lord, have faith in connection with that being a part of the process. Right? Well, I have more material and we're running short on time. So I'm going to skip to what I've determined to be the most important part this morning. Turn over. I'd like you to get two fingers ready because I want you to put one in Acts chapter 9 and one in Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 22. And as we look at these two texts, I think it's important that we understand the solid ground upon which we stand in regard to the imperative, essential nature of baptism in the saving process. You see, many of you will have folks come to you and they'll, they'll want to debate. And they're, they're sincere, well-meaning people. And they want to debate and discuss this question. And oftentimes you may not know where to go to make a convincing argument. Here it is. So you might want to take out a pen, piece of paper. You might want to write in the margin of your Bible because I'm about to give you a way to discuss this subject that in all of my years I have not yet, not yet, had anyone leave the discussion and not at least agree. Now not everyone has changed because some of them have said, well that's what it says, but I don't care, I'm still not going to change but not at least agree that the scriptures teach that baptism is the point of pardon, the point of salvation. So here it is. Saul of Tarsus has an amazing conversion story. In fact, most preachers throughout the United States and all different groups have a sermon they'll preach about once a year on Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Now, you may or may not realize it, but that very title gives a hint as to a person's theology in regard to baptism. If someone were to say, Saul was converted on the road to Damascus, they're making an assumption about conversion, 
and about salvation. Because when you go back and you look at the story, and there are two parallel stories of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, one in Acts chapter 9, and that's a third person account that Luke is telling in the book of Acts, and then in Acts chapter 22, there's a first person account when Paul himself retells his own story. But they're the same story, told in a little different language, but the same details. You look over in Acts chapter 9, and you see the beginning of the story. You remember he's on the road to Damascus to persecute, to imprison the people of God, Christians. And it tells us in verses 5 and 6, Acts chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, and he said, this is after he sees Jesus, the resurrected Christ who comes to him. And Saul, Saul says, who are you, Lord? And the Lord says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So trembling and astonished, Saul said, Lord, what would you want me to do? And the Lord said, arise and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Okay, here we have the first example. You look over in Acts chapter 22, write this down. That was Acts 9, 5 through 6. Now Acts 22. Acts chapter 22. And about verse 8. So I answered, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 10, so I said, what shall I do, Lord? Now what I want you to see is here on day one, now you, in your mind, and you might even write this on your piece of paper, you could make three blocks right next to each other, kind of like a cartoon strip in the newspaper. You know, it'll have three blocks. Block one, block two, block three. And at the top of the first one, you can write day one. So you have here on day one, Saul of Tarsus, he sees the resurrected Jesus. He falls down on the ground. He's blinded and he cries out these words. Who are you, Lord? Lord, what would you have me do? In other words, anything you ask of me, Lord, I'll do. The word Lord means master. Let me ask you this. Does he believe in Jesus Christ? Absolutely. He says, master, anything you want me to do, I'll do it. We call that belief. We call that strong belief. Right? So here we have day one, on the road to Damascus, Saul of Tarsus believes in Jesus Christ. So what I always do is I ask my friend who I'm studying with, is he saved? Well, the answer will most all of the time be, well, yes. That's why preachers preach a sermon entitled, Saul Saved on the Road to Damascus. Because if you believe that belief itself causes a person to be saved, then he must be saved. If belief in and of itself causes a person to be saved. Because he falls down and he says, Lord, he believes unquestionably, without any argument, he believes. So my friend will often say, well, yeah, he's saved. And I'll say, okay, what does it mean to be saved? And there'll be a lot of appropriate answers. Things like, well, it means to be right with God. Or the one you're looking for is, it means to have your sins washed away. Have your sins taken away. Now we move to day two. This is a three-day process if you haven't picked this up. Day two, Acts chapter 9, verse 11. It says, so the Lord said to him, he comes to Ananias and he tells Ananias to go preach to Saul. And he says, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. I write the word praying on day two. And this, of course, is found in Acts chapter 9, verse 11, Acts chapter 22 and verse 12. And then I love to think back to 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 16. You remember what that says? For Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am am the chief. I was once a, a, a blasphemer and an insolent man. What do you think Saul was praying about? Now he's just devoted his whole life to killing Christians. Now he found out Jesus really is the Christ. What do you think he's praying about? What do we call that when a person says, I can't believe the man I used to be. I was wrong. I don't want to be that man anymore. What do we call that? Forgiveness, but what do we call that in his mind? What a person's doing in that? Repentance. So here on day one, Saul of Tarsus said, Lord, anything you want me to do? And he believes. Now on day two, he's repenting. 
of his sins. He wants to be different. He knows he was wrong. So here he's believed and he's repented. Then I'll ask my neighbor, my friend, is he saved? He's believed and repented. And 99% of the time, I'll get an absolute assertive, well, yes. I'll just say, okay. Let's look at day three. Day three is found in two places. Acts chapter 9, verse 18. After Ananias goes to him, it says, immediately there fell off his eyes something like scales, and he received sight once more, and he rose and was baptized. So we see he was baptized, but that text there in Acts chapter 9 doesn't really explain why he was baptized. Someone might argue, well, he was saved on the road to Damascus, and then he was baptized as a demonstration of that salvation. So let's look over in Acts chapter 22 to Paul's own words about what happened. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. What's the next word to say? And wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. And I just gently, it's important to be gentle. I gently ask my friend. I'm confused. You said he was saved three days ago. And we've both acknowledged that being saved means your sins are washed away. Why does he still have sins three days later that need to be cleansed? Do you understand? And I just let the question sit. Folks, there is water in the plan. And we need to make sure that we know what we believe because it's from scriptures. We need, and if it's not, we need to change. But it's from the scriptures that we know what we believe and that we're able to communicate it clearly and lovingly and gently. Because here, at the Waterford Church of Christ, we want to be a people who have a loyalty, not to my opinion or Allie's opinion or Baxter, but only to His will in all things. If you're subject to an invitation this morning, maybe, maybe you need this message today. Maybe Ananias' words... We're not just intended for Saul of Tarsus 2,000 years ago. Maybe they're intended for you. And now, we'll ask you the same question. Why do you wait? Arise. And be baptized. And wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord as we stand and as we sing. Who at the door is dead.